YouTube stretches. Content. Like and subscribe. What's up, everyone? It's Betty Dots. As always, every time a new character in Guilty Gear Strive comes out, which new character did come out, I like to analyze their theme. And in this case, is the beloved Biken. Everyone's been waiting for Biken, everyone and their mom. Biken is, from what I understand, the most requested character in Guilty Gear Strive. So I know a lot of people are excited for her to be here. I personally wasn't very excited for her to come. You know, obviously the trailer was exciting and all that, but she didn't look like a character I would like want to play. But then I started playing her and I think she's going to be my secondary. I think after May, she's going to be my secondary because she's a very, very fun character to play. Unlike some of the other characters in the game she's not as hard i would argue that like jocko and happy chaos and maybe gold lewis are like some of the hardest characters in the whole game so it's kind of refreshing to see a character that you know you can just pick up and play and like get some stuff done on i think it's just very exciting i'm very happy to, <laughs> to actually have a dlc character that i like feel good when i'm playing not to say that the other characters are bad they're pretty interesting and very cool but i'm bad at fighting games so what are we gonna do about that what I am good at though is analyzing music and that's what we're gonna do today. This music teacher here has a lot of thoughts about the bike and theme and I think there's a lot of to uncover here. I think the lore heads are really gonna like this video because I investigated a little bit. I did a little bit of research and I looked into the lyrics and I think there's some like really cool things that Daisuke achieved with this song. As always, the first thing that we have to do is listen to the song, talk a little bit about what's going on in there. I have some points that I want to talk about specifically. Point out interesting things in terms of like music theory and in terms of composition, in terms of arrangement that are happening in the song, in terms of style as well. And at the end, we're going to give another listen through after, you know, learning all the things that we learned. We're going to listen to the song one more time and see if our perception changes about it. Let's go ahead and give Biken's theme a listen. <laughs> All right, well, that was an amazing song. I think Biken's theme is just doing so much, right? And I think initially I was a little bit overwhelmed in terms of analyzing it because I think it has a lot of different influences that are coming from a lot of different places. I don't think it's as clear cut as like Jocko's theme sounding like an anime song or Gold Lewis's theme having these very American influences to them, right? Like, I don't think it's as clear cut as that. Now, the important thing to like keep in mind with Biken is that she is one of the few japanese characters in guilty gear right and japan has a very important part in the lore when it comes to like guilty gear i don't want to get super into it but biken's story is a really sad one essentially what happened is that justice destroyed japan and after justice destroyed japan certain colonies were made in japan where essentially the people were like correct me in the comments if you want i don't understand if they're kept there or if they're living there to protect themselves from further violence but essentially what happened is that like biken was staying in one of these colonies and like some sort of like safe house her family got murdered and biken could see that it was that man asuka the like the the, the goat the magic goat right i guess besides happy chaos because happy chaos is that man's teacher we're not going to get super deep into the lore what we need to understand here is that biken is a person filled with grief and a person filled with anger and a person filled with vengeance. And as a Japanese person in the Guilty Gear lore, I feel like this makes a lot of sense. Now, because Biken is a Japanese samurai who's missing an arm and whose family got killed, I mean, right? Like, that's like the samurai story, referencing so many things like samurai history and like how it works. It makes a lot of sense to have a lot of Japanese influences going on in the song. And I, I think it's pretty obvious that there are, but there's also other things, right? That are also Japanese, but also not necessarily like. Japanese folk song. The first thing that I want to talk about is the intro. I think a lot of people have this opinion that like the intro is too much of a slow burner. It takes too long to start, especially considering how long or how short fights are in Guilty Gear's Drive. And I think that makes a lot of sense, but I do think it's a very powerful intro. If we're talking about it just as a song and not a fight song, and I quite like it as a fight song. Like having my first round be over this very esoteric, very like slow burning, like guitar intro is really nice. And I think one of the things that makes that intro special is the scale being used. So let's listen to that really quick. We're just gonna give the, uh, listen to the intro for a second. 
I think that like what they're doing here is very powerful because of the skill being used. Usually when we think of using skills that aren't the major skill or the minor skill, we're thinking of modes of the major skill. Just to give a very, very quick overview about how the modes of the major skill work. Talked about it a lot more during the Happy Chaos video. So if you want to check that out, it's going to be in that that corner, I think. It's like kind of like unlocking the power of the major skill, right? The major skill is one scale but it's also seven scales, depending on like what you make your home chord. Understanding that the major skill has seven chords and any of those chords could be like your, your home chord, your one chord. In fact, the minor skill that we talk about is not its own skill. That's just a mode of the major skill called the Aeolian mode. And when we hear modes of the major skill, yeah, there is a little bit of a defiance of like the original sound. It's not something that we're like completely used to hearing as humans because the history of like using modes in popular music is very short. Mind you, the history of modes themselves is extremely long. It was the Greeks that were first talking about modes thousands of years ago. But people didn't use modes that much. They stuck to the major mode and the minor mode. So they are a little bit of a jarring sound, but this is even more so because this is not a mode of the major skill. It is actually a mode of the harmonic minor skill. What they're using here is the Phrygian dominant mode. It's in B, so we can say that this song is in B Phrygian dominant. And look at how weird this scale sounds. One, flat two, three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. That's a Phrygian dominant skill. It's almost the same as a skill, but it has a major third. So it has this very, you know, it's like kind of like a foreign sort of sound. It doesn't sound like a Western music sort of deal, right? It almost sounds like Egyptian. It's like very much attached with that. It's also very attached with flamenco music, Spanish guitar. I think it has such a nice sound to it. So if you have an intro, it's using like B Phrygian dominant scale. And it's also doing this like rubato sort of situation. By the way, rubato in terms of rhythm, people think about it like, oh, there's no rhythm. And it's not that there's no rhythm, it's that the rhythm is malleable. It can stretch beats out and make other beats shorter to get this very floaty sort of sound. It has this like elasticity to it, right? That I think is like very desirable and that works really well here. If you're within the context of B Phrygian Dominant, you actually have a one chord that is major, right? B, D sharp and F sharp. That's a B major chord. And then you also have a flat two chord, a half step up, that is also major. It's a C major chord. Going from a one major to a flat two major is not a completely uncommon movement that does happen quite a bit. And it doesn't sound, doesn't sound completely outside. It definitely has like a place in music, but it's usually something that we think of as being in a major scale and stealing a chord, the flat two, from the frigid scale. In this case, both of these chords are already built into the scale and that scale is being used in those melodies around there. When you're dealing with a different scale, you're not only dealing with different notes, you're also dealing with different chords and those add the most flavor to what's going on there. And I think having that idea in the intro of having concise dramatic melodies that are rubato and very exciting in a, in a weird, like controlled way and tagging them with these beautiful, like harmonic ideas afterwards and having that back and forth between melody and harmony, I think works really well for the intro of this song. You see, isn't that nice? Weird scale gives you weird harmony. Beautiful intro that sets the whole thing up for like when the song starts picking up, right? With the beautiful bass, just like really, really gets us in there, right? When the song drops, we're still very much referencing that Phrygian dominant mode. So let's listen to that. <laughs> Obviously a scream is necessary. But I really want to talk about this. I really want to talk about what's going on here. Lyric. Musically, you have a very simple situation. Simple riff that is going boom, boom, ba, dum, ba, do, do, do. Like a Phrygian sort of idea. What I really like is the vocals, right? The vocals are doing this very straight, monotone idea over that riff that's just like singing. By the way, when I talk about monotone, I don't talk about something being boring, monotonous. Something as monotone is something that's singing the same note over and over. It's going na 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 The fifth of the scale. So you end up with this like weird sort of sound, right? When you have a monotone line in a song, it does have this like grounding, but also kind of spooky sound to it, especially if it's in the vocal. Because 
of what it refers to culturally. When I first listened to the song, I was like, okay, well, why are they doing monotone vocals, right? Like, there is some monotone vocals in like Japanese minyo, right? In like Japanese folk song, but it's not like the rule. We're going for like pentatonic scales, and like definitely some sort of sense of like melody. And sometimes you like linger on one note for a while, but you usually do go away from it. There's a lot of vibrato, right? So it didn't seem right. So I was like, okay, well, where does this come from? I decided that I should look at the lyrics of that section, and I did. And I'm gonna show Share what I found with you. We got this going on in terms of the word. I don't know Japanese, but I did a little bit of digging. The first thing I did was look up these lyrics, and then some very interesting things popped up. Oma bogia beiro shano makawara manihando ma jinbara harabari tayao. Excuse me, my pronunciation isn't right. Try my best, like do it the right way. Those words are actually a mantra. The mantra of light. Uh, that was like popularized in like Japanese Buddhist groups in like the Heian period. So I started looking into his mantra because it's like, okay, why do you throw a mantra in there? However, I will say that kind of explains the monotone vocals right away because when you're reciting a mantra, you're usually singing one note the whole time and doing usually like pretty low notes. So interestingly enough, this song is all based around this mantra. So what is the deal with the mantra of life? It seems that it was common in Japanese Buddhist culture when people died and when people died with especially bad karma, when there was like maybe some sort of hatred within them, maybe they didn't have the resolution that they had, maybe they had bad luck throughout their life. There is a ritual that was performed in their funeral called the Dosha Kaji. The mantra would be recited during the funeral to essentially free the body from this possible bad karma that they could have gotten from life and then hopefully within like Buddhist culture ensure a better afterlife, a favorable rebirth. Interestingly enough, this is a direct quote of the mantra of light that is happening in Baikin's song, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Like Baikin is a, a character that is filled with hatred, filled with vengeance, and who is maybe like trying to let go of that vengeance for the first time. This song appears to be a sort of purification of, of Baikin, right? A way for Baikin to free herself from the burdens from before and achieving it through like a Japanese Buddhist approach makes a lot of sense. Now, I'm not completely sure about this. Again, I don't speak Japanese and there are a lot of other Japanese lyrics here that I couldn't translate, but I was really interested in translating this, which was right after that mantra. So it says, Waraku ni uta wo rokon shoyo. I looked up this phrase. The first thing I did was plug it into Google Translate. It didn't make any sense. So I decided to like, go into each word and try to figure out like the grammar of it. I have my notes right here. Waraku means peace and harmony, it seems. And then uta means song. Rokon shoyo apparently is a common phrase uh, to talk about the purification of the six senses. Letting go of some sort of perception is what it seems to refer to to me. I started like connecting with the ni, well, that means to, like towards something, right? And wo, which means of something. What I came up with is like, okay, this is the song of like a six sense purification to to achieve peace and harmony as a way that i read it i might be wrong please correct me if i'm wrong in the comments it seems like okay after saying that mantra we're saying like okay this is a song of purification for me to achieve peace and harmony within me if that's even possible with all this hatred that i've been carrying for a long time i think further references in the lyrics to anji right there's a small reference to like the friends that you made along the way and anji is like biken's close friend i think it kind of shows that biken is sh going for that sort of healing that maybe this mantra of light could provide. This is very interesting. I went into a rabbit hole and I spent a lot of time reading about like all these things. And obviously I'm not an expert or anything like that. They just ended up being like a very cool reference to have here. One that's maybe a little bit hidden for someone that doesn't know the practices of Japanese Buddhism, me being one of those people. But after a little bit of research, I was able to like uncover a new layer to the song. That was just very, very interesting to me. At the beginning it's saying Madaru, right? M-A-D-A-R-U. I don't know what that means. I tried looking it up a million times and I couldn't find a single translation for that. It seems to be a name. I don't know if Baikin is calling out a name. I looked up for the name Madaru in the Guilty Gear like canon and it doesn't seem to exist. So please let me know in the comments if you know what that means because I have no idea. Right there. Madaru. And here's that mantra. And it makes a lot of sense because like 
when they go into what a new the world can show you it seems like at that point they're like getting outside of the mantra you see how the voice stops being down below the voice stops being like very monotonous the way that like a a mantra would be like recited and it goes into like a little bit more energy and goes an octave higher it doesn't necessarily change the note but it does sort of change the note and then we have like this very like I mean, it seems like the rest of the content of the song is kind of doing your standard like thrash metal practice, right? Like, I think some of the stuff had to be like, transitioned between with like more traditional metal sort of practices. It's very reminiscent of Megadeth to me. It seems like a lot of these riffs are very like inspired by like Dave Mustaine sort of riffage. Lyrically, you'll see that in a lot of these like kind of like real verses and like all these things. It's called like the normal verse. There's a lot of talking about you know i'm being a ghost call my name i am the time exile when you read the english lyrics under the like idea of the mantra and what the mantra represents for like the whole song then everything starts making a lot of sense it's like there's a struggle an internal struggle within bike and and more importantly like a desire to become at peace with what happened in her path kind of lines up perfectly chronologically with like the idea that, like apparently that man is not bad according to the story in terms of talking about the japanese influence on the song and the the influence of the Japanese folk song mean means folk or the people and then yo means song right so this is a compound word talking about the Japanese folk song in northern minyo it seems like in this like two four boom boom sort of feel that they have that there's more of a stress on beat one in the south the accent is on the second beat like a boom 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 I would say that this song is specifically referencing the southern minyo which has an accent on beat two at least traditionally right but these minyo have often what we call a kakegoe. It seems to me that in the pre-chorus, we're referencing the idea of the kakegoe. So what's a kakegoe? It's see, in Japanese folk song, there is often shouts, pitch shouts that happen, exclamations, right? Where it just kind of sounds like someone's like cheering or saying something really loud and it's kind of like a scream. If you listen to the pre-chorus of the Baikin theme, let's have it back. <laughs> 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 You see, there's like a, a calm response. Couple things that are direct references to like Japanese music. There are these shouts, right? That are not necessarily words at this point, right? But it seems to be a reference to the idea of the kakegoe. And there's also this call and response between the shouting voice and the kind of ch more chanty voice. And I think that like that relationship is a direct reference to like Japanese folk music. A very clever one, right? Because it's tiny. It's a very subtle reference that I think is very effective in like creating the idea of the song. By the way, speaking of the idea of like Southern music, mean you're having an accent on beat two i don't think daisuke has ever allowed himself to do a beat like the one that happens during the chant it feels so straightforward in terms of the drums it's funny that like in this section of the song they're opting for a one two one two is that a reference to southern japanese folk song all right, so this chorus, the thing about this chorus is that it's like not, it's not very exciting. I don't think it has to be though. The chorus is kind of the part where Daisuke lets go of the Phrygian dominant mode and just goes to B minor, like regular B minor, right? So it's doing like flat six to flat seven to one. And I'm laughing because I feel like I've talked about this so many times. So I have a flat six, which is G major. I have a flat seven, which is A major and then B minor at the top, which is my one chord. And then it just goes four, five, six, right? So it's doing this very sequential thing. Flat six, flat seven, one, four. Maybe like because stuff was so out there before, he really wanted to make it as simple as possible. But as you can see, this chord progression right here, flat six to flat seven to one, is just going up the scales. It's going G, A, B, and then down to the E. And then from the E, just starts again on the E and goes up the scale again. Maybe this is like a good explanation for you as to why, if this song felt kind of weird to you, this is a part that sounds kind of normal and kind of like, eh, okay, that's pretty cool. So at the end, it does go to the flat seven. So it, it keeps going up to the scale and then it goes back to the flat six for the repeat. There really doesn't seem to be a lot happening on verse two. It's just like kind of him singing a little bit different. I do love this free chorus. I think that like the reference to Kakegoe and like that chanty voice and like that, this rhythm, boom, 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 boom. I don't know if he's referencing something there, but it doesn't seem like it. Maybe Taiko drumming. Oh, 
that makes a lot of sense. So if you don't know about taiko drumming, it's very common in like Japanese folk song and Japanese culture in general. I think there's even like a video game about like taiko drumming. There are these big drums where people like do all these things and they usually like mark important parts in like folk songs in Japan. I mean, to me, it seems like the simplification of the beat I just thought about. It's not the rhythms that you would hear, but maybe to make it fit more of the song, they just want to do like something that's like referential to that. So you have the chant sort of vocals, you have the kakegoi sort of vocals in the back, kind of doing these shouts, these acclamations. And then you have like a marked beat that is done by like one or two percussion elements that kind of references taiko drumming. That could be a plausible thing. I'm not gonna like 100% commit to that. After this chorus, we have the guitar solo. Even though they are going to the minor scale on the chorus, the solo that they play after the chorus does stick to that weird Phrygian dominant scale, right? You can hear it. You see how it doesn't sound out of place at all. It feels like it works perfectly. I think that's one of the reasons why the solo sounds so special and it sounds so cool and challenging is because it has this like very outside sort of sound that fits perfectly with the song in my opinion because it's been using the Phrygian dominant skill so much. Honestly, very good use of the Phrygian dominant skill throughout this whole song. And here we have this beautiful section. I just want to listen to it because it's like, it's so masterfully performed. I would almost say that like that guitar and synth section is unnecessary. I wish it wasn't there. I honestly wish it just, just kept on going because I think it's so, so nice. Two very important instruments in the Japanese folk canon are being used there, right? So it sounds to me like the main instrument playing there, playing so many notes and doing it in such a beautiful, like resonant way is a 13 string scyther from Japan called the Koto. Maybe you've heard of the Koto before. Kind of looks like this a little bit. If that's a Koto. Right? So with a Koto, apparently, you you have uh, three picks and you're using these three picks to hit all these strings and so you get all these sounds initially I thought is this a shamisen but the shamisen is just like a three string lute that's not gonna be able to play as many notes as this is playing and shamisen music in general just like pedals on one open string the whole time the koto in terms of like composition people went really really hard with it so a very very important instrument in like japanese music makes perfect sense to put it in this sort of bridge of bike and song if you want to hear a koto in action i do have a video over here of this person playing <laughs> So one thing that you want to like pay attention to, if you look at her right hand, she has kind of picks attached to, to three of her fingers and she's hitting a number of strings at the same time while the left hand is accompanying with plucks. They're like plucking those strings. Obviously, this is a much bigger uh, koto that we saw in the picture that I showed before, but I mean, like many instruments, they come in very various shapes and forms. So obviously, it has a little bit of like a reminiscent idea to the harp in terms of like the complexity of the sound because you have all this ability to like accompany yourself and like play melodies at the same time. At the same time, you got three fingers dealing with the melody so you can accompany yourself with the with the same hand. I don't know. I think it's a very, very fascinating instrument that has a resonance that to me is really, really beautiful. Oh, you see that? I didn't even know that that's how they bent them. Look at how she bends the string. Oh my gosh. So as she's accompanying, she presses down on the other side of the string to get that bend. That is beautiful. I'll link this video in the description so you can see the koto in action. Besides that koto main instrument that's like taking over that bridge section, there's also a shinobue flute or what I think is a shinobue flute kind of accompanying in the back just giving you like kind of a breathy like sort of fresh air in the back that I really really like I love this section I almost like really dislike the guitar and synth solo that goes after because it's just like takes you out of this like very beautiful moment for no reason like I feel like you could have just skipped that you hear the flute in the back That is so nice. I think that sounds so beautiful. Oh, there's a little bend there. They did a little bend. Honestly, this part, take it out. You can take this part out. Like who said I wanted to like listen to Dream Theater after I like get done with this like beautiful like Japanese folk sound? Like who said this? 
who made this decision i like i i'm kind of i hadn't thought about it but i'm kind of upset about that part like for what it straight up sounds like bat dream theater i do want to like give you some like kind of like thoughts in the end right so we've looked at a lot of very interesting things with this song the use of the mantra of light in the verses or in the verses like kind of weird pre-verse sort of situation is really really clever i like the way that it's chanted with this like very low voice that break off from the mantra to say hey this is a song to purify myself or to at least attempt to purify myself purify my six senses not think of the past anymore and do this i think is very relevant for viking and it sets up the stage very well without doing it really cheesily in english having like a, a very nice like cultural attachment to like what's going on there i think that that ties all the song together and it does very very well in doing that besides that the references to the meal the japanese folk song i think they're done masterfully as well i think they're very subtle it doesn't like really lean on it too much except for that bridge section which i think is a big highlight of the song i wish it wasn't so late in the song so it's easier to like get to it during a fight i think the combination of the the koto and the shinobu it kind of working together to have beautiful arrangement works so so well and it sounds so beautiful within the song it definitely gives you like a breath of fresh air that i think the song needs at that point and then it just slams you with that weird synth and guitar thing that i just want to like get out of there i, I don't understand what like that on there besides that in the pre-chorus they have the return of the chant right so like the singer is doing this chant again but in the back you have someone like shouting and going like whoo ha ha and like doing like little laughs and stuff which seems to be referential to the practice of the kakegoe that happens in the japanese folk song as well as it like very marked like kung, 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 sort of rhythm that to me could be referencing the idea of like taiko drum accompaniment behind also very fascinating and very like filled with tradition instrument that is still very popular today also a very like great thing that the song does is rely so much on the phrygian dominant scale so the phrygian dominant scale is not a very conventional scale which allows for some very interesting like major scale tonality that we see very much explored during the intro of the song which again i love the intro i, I know a lot of people don't like it and they don't like that it takes so long to start but i like it quite a bit and if the song just goes from the intro to the chant during a fight and then the fight ends, I think that's enough because those are kind of like, besides the bridge, those are kind of like the coolest parts of the song. You also have a solo that's in Frigid Dominant, even though it's like not as obvious, it still has that. Most of the sections of the song that aren't the chorus are participating in this very kind of outside mode. So I think that's a daring thing to do because it's a mode that sounds like very out of place but because it is a song that's referencing japanese music it makes a lot of sense to use a mode that doesn't sound western i think it achieves what it wants to achieve very very well outside of that weird synth and guitar section after the beautiful koto and shinobu section i think that daisuke did a wonderful job with the song i think all of the dlc songs have been great but this one seems to have like a thickness to it underneath that's just very very cool right and it's funny thinking about like oh bike is a funny uh, samurai boob samurai character it's funny that, like when you think about biking like that and you juxtapose it with a song that is like so attentive to who she is and not only what her story is, but like what her feelings are, what her emotions are, what her comeuppance is, the culture that she was brought into, what happens to her. I don't know. I think that like it's really cool that for a character that people just like because of the way that she looks, that they worked so hard on like building everything else that isn't the way she looks through this song. Let's go ahead and listen to it one more time together now that we've learned all these different things and then we'll wrap this thing up thank you so much for uh hanging out this has been fun what a great intro i think starting uh, let's be uh, let's be real like starting a fight like this is badass like come on you're getting ready to fight and you're like it's like Especially if you let the intros rock and it's just going the whole time. Does that happen? I'll have to check that. Ah. Oh, we haven't even talked about it. There's like straight up a scream. Is that also a reference to the Kakegoe? I guess that makes sense. That's like the, the like main part of the song that people think about. Again, if someone knows what Madaru means, I cannot find it anywhere. Please leave it in the comments. Here we go. There's a mantra of light.
I think it's done so well. I think it's such a beautiful song. Like even that section, I didn't even talk about it, but it's just such a nice transition into his like sort of like thrashier riff, right? So we go to Japan or back to the English vocals. And if you look at the the English lyrics, they are very much they seem to be from the perspective of Biden, more like explaining where she's coming from, where she's at, what she's thinking. There's those shouts in the back, right? At least And those like kind of like very minimal percussion accompaniment that I think maybe references taiko drumming. Our chorus is very standard. It just goes to a, the B minor scale. Does a very, very nice sequential chord progression. It doesn't really do anything. It's fine. Like I said before, it's like a good respite for the song, but I don't know how much I like it. Like, it's definitely not a highlight of the song the way that a chorus, I think, should be. Anyway. That's cool. Sever, tear, fear. We go back to our chant. Still with that. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. That accent on two. Okay. Definitely like a thrash sort of, you know, you got the one guitar on one side and then the other guitar pops up, the bass comes in. That's just very, very common, like 80s thrash metal music. Like sort of deal. second verse doesn't really do that much it's just like Naoto singing a little bit louder and higher this second pre-chorus doesn't change that much either but I think this part is already so interesting and cool that they didn't necessarily need to develop it it's also very short they do have that transition into a chorus though again kind of lukewarm about the chorus don't necessarily have a lot of love for it. Like, it's not bad, but with so many interesting things in this song, it just kind of throws me out of the groove of like, like I wish it would have just kept the interesting things. You know what I mean? Here's a solo, which we said is in B fridge and dominant, so. Kind of cool skill to do a metal solo on. I think it makes it sound so cool. It makes it sound like kind of like badass. I don't know. It has something to it. Here's the beautiful Koto and Shinobue section. Oh my god. This is just so beautiful. I don't even want to talk. That's so good. Why you do this, Isaac? Why why you do this? I think this is a bad decision. This is the only thing in the song that I would say is a bad decision. Like, why would you take me out of that? If you're gonna go to a quiet part anyway, like in a second, literally in 10 seconds, you're gonna go do your weird musical outro that you always do. Why did you take me out of that dream like that? With like a dream theater, like, off-brand dream theater situation. That's where she's talking about Anji, so I guess this song is, this part is kind of important. I feel like that would have fit a lot better if you had just taken out everything between the Koto section and that quiet vocal section. I still don't love the quiet vocal section, but I think it would have worked a lot better. The final choruses do a lot of like really cool things. Because you got the chorus underneath, and then Naoto's just going off at the top, just saying, saying, like singing all these different things. Then the chorus evolves into having the mantra at the top. The drums drop out. Oh, that's beautiful. That's chilling. Like him leaving that note held on while the mantra is going on. That gives me chills. That 
that's great. If I'm gonna give you like very quick final thoughts, I love it. I think it's one of the best songs in the soundtrack. I know I've been saying this about most of the songs, but this one has like a, it has a lot of things inside of them that makes it very special. And I think the more I researched and the more I looked into it, the more I got into the song and the more I like understood what I liked about it. If I would say like highlights are like the bridge, obviously the like Koto and Shinobue situation is beautiful. The intro is also really good. I think it really sets you up for that battle and like really sets you up to hear like, hey, we got a Frigid Dominant composition coming up right now. So get used to it with this quiet intro. And obviously the mantra section, that's like the biggest highlight of the song it's kind of like what makes the song and what ties everything together if i was going to talk about like sort of like the parts that i don't like that much the chorus is kind of eh. the synth section that happens after the koto section needs to go like i don't like that part at all i think it like could just not be there it could have transitioned from the quiet koto section into the and done all that and it would have been just fine I want to thank all of you for sticking around with me for so long with this song analysis. I think I had to go back to the shed and like do a little bit of research to like truly understand this one. And I'm really glad I did because I feel like this analysis ended up being a lot more fruitful. If you've been watching like the whole thing, thank you so much for sticking around. If you like these videos, go ahead and like, you know, subscribe and like like and do all the things that people tell you to do like these do take a lot of work and it's only me working on them and the channel is kind of tiny right so like any subscriber always makes me really happy and like seeing new people get into the channel i know that this is like a pretty niche thing to talk about like hey let's analyze fighting game music but i mean i think there's a deep relationship between fighting game and music that as a music teacher and a music theory sort of expert i like really enjoy exploring that so if you dig the channel thank you so much for your support i guess i will see you whenever some more fighting game music comes out thank you so much for watching take care